exist here. Unless it's clear that there is a price to pay for Jewish lives, we will not be able to survive. And that's what counts. Ben-Gurion was such a believer in the importance of agricultural settlements that he abandoned the prime ministership and joined a kibbutz in the desert. He was succeeded by Moshe Sharet, who hoped he could advance Israeli security through diplomacy. But his minister of defense, Pinchas Lavon, believed in military solutions. In July 1954, the British announced they were quitting their huge military base on the Suez Canal. We feared we would be exposed to an attack from Egypt. The fact that the British army was there served as a buffer. It reduced the chance of an Egyptian attack. On his own, Lavon ordered plans for destabilizing Egypt and frightening the British into remaining. Lavon summoned the director of military intelligence to his home in Tel Aviv. Lavon would not stop talking about the need for action. He suggested all sorts of schemes. We cooked up a plan to hit targets in Egypt. Lavon said, go ahead, activate the unit. In Egypt, Israeli military intelligence had recruited young Jews to act as saboteurs. I was ready to do anything to help Israel. I was idealistic. I was naive. A code word broadcast during Israeli radio's Housewives Choice was the signal to act. In Cairo, I went to one cinema, my friend went to another. I put the bomb under an empty seat. No one was killed and the saboteurs were all caught. The news was splashed across Egyptian newspapers. So I went to Charet and said, look, uh, this is the communique from Cairo. What do you know about it? He said, no, 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 no. This is not authentic, it can't be, because how can such a thing happen? <coughs> I, the prime minister, doesn't know about it. After he learned of Levan's role, Charette's first priority was to save the lives of the young Jews. Moshe Sharet called on me. He said, the cabinet is worried about the prisoners in Egypt. We must prevent death sentences. In a bid for mercy, Sharet sent Devon to Paris to reveal the truth to Nasser's envoy. Devon told me the plot was hatched in the Ministry of Defense. Charette had no idea about it. Nasser's response was not what Charette had hoped for. In Cairo, two of the saboteurs were executed. The others went to prison, Marcel Nino and Robert Dassa, for 15 years. Charette, in his office that night, confided to his diary that he was living through a nightmare. If I do not remove Levon, I am supporting something rotten that will destroy the defense ministry and army command. If I do act, it will destroy the party and cause a scandal. What should I do? Lavon was dismissed from his post as defense minister, but the damage was done. Egypt also was playing with fire. In Gaza, it recruited and trained Palestinians for military action. They paid four pounds a month. In those days, it was a lot of money. 
so it was good. They were sent to Israel to gather intelligence and commit sabotage. They would see if an airport was built and come back and report. Others went on military operations and carried out attacks. These infiltrators, the Fedayeen, were a tremendous security problem, not only for the settlers on the borders, but also in the center of the country. They were attacking places five kilometers from Tel Aviv. The frequent attacks and the loss of lives were not only a disaster for the victims' families, they fostered a profound sense of helplessness among Israelis. The government seemed unable to protect its own people. Only one man could satisfy the public's demand for action. Within months, Ben-Gurion was back as prime minister. By mid-1955, Nasser turned to the Soviet bloc for economic and military assistance. The conflict now became part of the Cold War, and Egypt received a huge arms shipment from Czechoslovakia. New tanks, artillery, bombers, and jet fighters threatened to render the Israeli army and its propeller air force obsolete. General Moshe Dayan wanted to strike at the Egyptian army before it could absorb its new weapons. But Ben-Gurion felt Israel could not fight alone. Ben-Gurion became more and more convinced that uh, there is no diplomatic solution for the conflict. And because of the accumulation of arms in uh, Egypt, um, we have to forestall war triggered by Egypt. A few weeks later, President Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Unexpectedly, Ben-Gurion found himself with two new allies. Britain and France had jointly owned the canal and wanted it back. Ben-Gurion sent Shimon Peres to a secret meeting in Paris. The French defense minister told me Britain and France were planning an operation to take the Suez Canal back from Nasser. And he asked me, would Israel join them? How long would it take Israeli troops to reach the canal? Ben-Gurion waited anxiously for the return of his emissary. Ben-Gurion asked me, well, what did the French say? So I began to tell him about their plan. He interrupted and said, OK, this changes everything. We'll go with them. Israel invaded Egypt secretly supported by Britain and France. Within a week, Israeli troops had captured the Sinai Desert. Britain and France tried to retake the Suez Canal until international pressure forced them to withdraw. But for Israel, the war was a triumph. We achieved our main purpose. The main purpose was free navigation in the Straits of Elat, which is rather vital. And this we have until now. The second objective was to secure safety for our settlements near the Gaza Strip. I cannot say we got it entirely, but there are more safe than the war before. The Israeli forces withdrew from Sinai, and the positions along the Israeli border and the Straits of Tehran 
were guarded by United Nations forces. For 10 years, there was peace along the Israeli-Egyptian border under the UN flag.